Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our circuit service, which today is coming to you from uh, Broomhedge. Those who are watching at home or those who are listening in, or whatever way you are joining with us this morning, we trust that you'll really feel a real sense of God's presence. These have been difficult days, but thankfully it seems now that we are coming to uh, the end of the, the lockdown period. As Christians, we know that as we have walked through these difficult times, there's been one who has been walking with us, and that is the Lord God. The old hymn puts it so well, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. We've carried heavy burdens. People have suffered. People have sadly died. But the second verse says, Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief, nor a loss, not a frown, nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. And I trust that as we join together in this service, we will be encouraged and strengthened and blessed.
Now we're going to join together in our opening prayer and there are four things that we try to do in every opening prayer as we uh, commend a service to the Lord. First thing we do is we acknowledge the greatness of God and then secondly we acknowledge our sinfulness and therefore our unworthiness to take part in a service of worship. And thirdly, we rejoice in those wonderful words which simply say, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. And then finally, we pray that God will guide us and bless us throughout the remainder of the service and that he'll then send us out in peace and in his power to serve him throughout the rest of the week. So let's join in prayer. I'm going to use the words of the first uh, few verses from Isaiah chapter 6 uh, in our opening prayers this morning. Words which encapsulate all these elements that I've mentioned. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Those amazing images present us with a picture of who God really is. A righteous, holy God. The all-powerful creator of heaven and earth and sea and sky. When faced with that awesome image, all that the prophet Isaiah could do was fall on his knees in wonder and awe and worship this holy God. May we today be enabled to acknowledge the greatness of God and to offer him the worship and the respect that is his due. Speak to us in the quietness, Lord, and may we see you as you really are. The second thing that the prophet Isaiah did was to acknowledge his unworthiness, his sinfulness. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. May we today be prepared to come to the foot of the Lord Jesus Christ's cross and confess our sins, acknowledging that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In a moment of quiet and reflection, let's simply examine our lives and admit our sins to God. The third thing that happened in Isaiah's vision was that he received an assurance of God's forgiveness. 
Then one of the serfs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Today, may we glory in the good news of, that our Lord offers the free gift of forgiveness to all who trust in him. St. John says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then finally we pray that everything that is done and said in the remainder of this service will equip us and inspire us to take our new or our rekindled faith into the world, living lives that will be pleasing to God. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. So Lord, bless everyone who will take part in this service today. Bless all your people across our circuit and across our province and across our world. May all of us be guided and inspired and encouraged to live holy lives, lives which will be pleasing to you and which will be a blessing to others. And we offer this prayer in the name of the one who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning to our young people, and especially to all those young people who have been doing schoolwork at home. That's been something that many of you have been doing over this past number of weeks, and I know that's been very difficult. It's been difficult for you, it's been difficult for your teachers, and it's been difficult for your parents who have been helping you. But thank you for all that you have been doing, and I know you've been working hard at it, and I want to uh, encourage you this morning by telling you about a, a farmer who didn't think much about maths. Whenever he decided that he was going to retire from his farming, and he was going to give his 17 cows, he had 17 cows, and he was going to give his 17 cows to his three nephews. So firstly, he had 17 cows, and to his oldest nephew, he said he would give a half of the 17 cows, and to his second nephew, he would give a third, and to his youngest nephew, he would give a ninth. So that's a half, and a third, and a ninth. Half of 17 cows, well that doesn't really work very well, because that's really, well that's really eight and a half cows, and you can't have half a cow. And a third, well that's five and, well, more than a half, a big bit of a cow, and that doesn't work very well. And so the three boys started to fall out. They started to fall out with each other because they couldn't agree on how they were going to divide the cows up. There was a neighbour, and he was a kind man, and he didn't like to see the three brothers falling out. And he had one cow. So he came to the three brothers with his one cow and he said to the three brothers, look, I have one cow, I will give you my cow if that is any help. So that's what he did. He brought his one cow and that meant they had now 18 cows between them. 
And that made things a, a lot simpler. Because when they had 18 cows, and half of 18 cows is 9, and a third of 18 cows is 6, and the ninth of 18 cows is 2. So the boys were all happy. They were all getting what they thought they deserved. 9 and 6 is 15 and 2 are 17. So they had only given out 17 cows. Then they came up with an idea. They thought, why do we not give out our 17 cows and then give our neighbour back the cow that he had? And that's what they did. And everyone was happy. So what do we learn from that story? Well, I think we learn uh, two truths. I think the first truth we learn is that there really is enough to go around. There really is enough for everyone if we just learn how to share. And that's an important truth. And it's an important truth uh, that we have been reminded over this past number of weeks. There is enough for everyone if we learn how to share. And the second truth, well I think the second truth is a great truth because it reminds us of another loving father who had one and only that he gave to bring peace to everyone. And when that peace was brought, that son went back to be with the father. And that is a great truth that we all need to learn, both young and old. I hope you remember both of those truths and I hope you remember it because of this story of how you divide up 17 cows between three boys. Thank you for listening and God bless you. The first reading is Romans chapter 7 verses 15 to 25. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then turning to Matthew chapter 11 verses 25 to 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen.
my soul be still and do not fear the winds of change may rage Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Some of you uh, might be aware that by trade my father was a saddler. And indeed, at one stage in my early life, uh, I was very interested in following him in that profession. One of the key skills of a saddler is the ability to measure a pony or a horse and from those measurements to make a set of harness that would fit perfectly. And when two horses work together, then each of the horses would have to have its own harness, each fitting perfectly. And these were the skills of a saddler. In New Testament days, saddlery had its related trades. We are reminded of that when we read of the Apostle Paul, 
who was a tent maker. While we cannot be sure of the exact things that uh, Paul would have made or would have worked with, we know that he would have worked with animal skins and in that he was a sort of a first century saddler. Today the trade of saddlery is made more popular through the popularity of the sporting horse. But not so long ago the skill of the saddler was primarily required for the working horse. In New Testament days, horses were not the primary working animal, but oxen were. And the primary harness for an ox was not leather harness, but a wooden yoke. A single wooden beam that would be set across the shoulders of the ox and the plough or the cart or the instrument would be attached to that yoke. But the more common sight was that of two oxen working together and that required a double yoke, a wooden beam that would sit across the shoulders of both animals, thus enabling them to work together and to evenly take the strain of the load. And if the yoke was well made, it rested easily on the shoulders of the animal and the burden was light. But if the yoke was badly made, then it fitted badly and it rubbed uncomfortably against the animal and the burden felt much heavier than what it should have been and it was more difficult to pull. And this of course is what Jesus is talking about in these verses. Once again Jesus is taking a familiar farming scene and from that familiar farming scene he is illustrating a great truth. On this occasion he is talking about something that not only his hearers were familiar with but he himself would have been very familiar with. Remember, Jesus grew up the son of the carpenter Joseph and he grew up around the carpenter's shop. So these yokes for the local farmers would have almost certainly have been made in that shop. They had been measured for the oxen and they had been made with the hands of Joseph and his fellow carpenters. So we can be sure that Jesus knew the importance of a well-measured and a well-fitted yoke. But what does the, the picture say to us in this age? Two suggestions I, I believe we find in these verses. Firstly, we are reminded of the yoke of burden. The yoke of burden. As I've said, a, a yoke to work well had to be made well. It had to be measured perfectly and it had to be made to those measurements if it was going to fit the animal. And those who were listening to Jesus on this occasion knew that truth. They knew the word yoke meant something which placed the burden on the shoulders. In Jesus' day, the word yoke was a culturally familiar word. Scattered throughout the Old Testament, there are many references to the yoke of burden. Sometimes the yoke of burden was the burden of oppression from political or military regimes. Like in Isaiah, in that passage that we often read at Christmas time, Isaiah 9, 4, For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Even Isaiah could see all those years before Jesus that the yoke that Jesus would bring would not be like the yoke that they knew so well, the yoke of oppression, but it would be a different sort of yoke. Again, in the New Testament, we find that that yoke of burden was not always external, but sometimes it was internal to their own culture. The Pharisees spoke of the yoke of the law. In other words, for them, religion was all about obeying the law. And so the Pharisees worked to develop the Jewish law into a law of observance, taking the Ten Commandments and expanding them into something like 600 detailed tactical laws. Naturally, such legal observance soon became a burden. It was the yoke of burden, and Jesus recognised that. He recognised that in these verses when he refers to the wise and learned, the Pharisees who were so preoccupied with the yoke of the law that they failed to understand his message and his ministry. 
And that is, I believe, why in this passage, Jesus record, is recorded as saying, at that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. So the yoke of burden was something familiar with these first century hearers. It's one of the strange paradoxes in life that it takes very little for the blessings of life to become the burdens of life. The law was given as a blessing for the people, but the religious leaders, the Pharisees, had turned it into a burden. And Jesus makes it clear that that is why he came. He came to turn those burdens back into blessings. And that is the good news of the gospel. Jesus came to fulfill the law, to bring the law into a new place. I think the message is very simple and it is very clear and it's important to us at this moment in time. As we begin to prepare for going back into worship in our churches each Sunday, it's important to reflect on what lockdown has meant to each of us. This period of lockdown has been a difficult period for all of us. But like any difficult period that we experience in life, we can learn from that experience. So often as we look back on life and look back at the difficult periods, it's not the suffering that becomes important, but it is how we have reacted to it. In our Bible studies over the past few weeks in Priest Hill, this period of lockdown, we have been looking at the book of Job. And there are so many lessons in that book. But one of them that has come to the fore of our minds as we reflected on the whole book is that we learn that what is not important is that we understand the why or the wherefore of Job's suffering. But we learn from how he reacted to his suffering. We learn that as Job trusted in God throughout his period of suffering, then he found that God sustained him and eventually blessed him. And how Job, by not focusing on his own suffering, by not suffering on what he had lost in his family and his wealth, but suffering, but focusing on his relationship with God. When Job focused on that, he eventually came from this period of burden into a period of blessing. And so the yoke of burden that COVID-19 has been, if we can learn anything from it, if we can take anything away from it, then perhaps it is this. As we listen to what Jesus is saying, the yoke that has been a burden could indeed become a blessing. The burden is lifted. This burden is lifted when we look to him who shares our load. The hymn writer was so right when he wrote the words, burdens are lifted at Calvary because Jesus is very near. And that is what Jesus is saying here. Come to me. See how personal it is. And I see how personal it is. The yoke of burden can become the yoke of blessing. Jesus puts it very simply, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Here we have the, the good news of the gospel. As identified in our new president's theme, grace without limits. The yoke that we carry when we walk with Jesus becomes light because he knows our fit. He knows what we can bear. And the burdens we carry fit our shoulders because Jesus shares the load. When we are in relationship with Jesus, Jesus makes the fit perfect for us. Recently, uh, I was in Marks and Spencer's looking for a new suit. And what a range available. Suits for men who were super slim with narrow shoulders. 
that wasn't for me. Suits for men who were slim. Suits for men who required a tailored fit. Suits for men who required, required a classic fit. Everyone different because each of our shoulders are different. Jesus gives us a load in life that is tailor-made when we bring him beside us so that he can share in our burdens. No, he doesn't take the whole of the burden. We still have our share to carry. But he makes sure that what we do carry is not beyond our own capability. Just over a year ago in this church I'm in this morning in Broom Hedge, we held a flower festival. Uh, and the theme for that flower festival was the walks in the Bible. And when the theme was being developed, one of the flower rangers felt that uh, although the story is not in the Bible, that we should finish with that story of footprints. I'm sure you know the story well. No one is quite sure of who the author is or what the origin is. But the story tells of a man who had a dream. A dream he was walking along a beach with the Lord uh, as the sky flashed the scenes of his life before him. From each scene he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to him and one belonging to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand. He noticed how many times along the pathway there seemed to be only one set of footprints. At first he asked the question, Why, Lord, were you not with me? Because those were the difficult times. And then the Lord replied to him, My precious, precious child, I love you, I would never leave you during your times of trial and suffering when you only see one set of footprints. It was then that I carried you. We don't know the author of the story, but we can understand the context as we reflect on this difficult period of lockdown. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. With him, we find rest unto our souls. And if we can learn anything from this period of lockdown, it surely must be this. It would be so easy to simply return to our churches for worship as if nothing had happened. It would be so easy to return from lockdown to everyday life as if nothing had changed. And yet, everything has changed. Church was, church is the body of Christ's people. The people he has given us to walk beside us. Those who are yoked with him in faith. Each one part of the body. Each one sharing in the burden. I often think it's not insignificant that the cross and the yoke are, are made out of the same material. That they're made in the same shop. That they are made with the same hands. And in the context, they, in the context of this story, they're involved in the same work. Taking the burdens that by ourselves we could not carry. And church is the community of people that share with us in carrying the load. Christ has given us these people. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Amen. In our prayers for others, we will pray for families, for our health service, the business community and all those involved in education. We also bring before you the President of our Church, our Ministers throughout Ireland and our own Lisburn and Moor Circuit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and for the joy and privilege of being able to come together this morning as a church family. Over recent months, we have all been challenged in ways like never before. How we live our lives, how we work, how we communicate. 
We pray for our families, particularly those who have been dealing with the pressures of working from home and with homeschooling. Also those with family members living or working away from home. Lord, we ask your blessing upon them all. We bring before you those who have been shielding. It has been a particularly difficult time for them. Coming out of shielding will present mixed emotions. For some there will be relief and for others there may be anxiety and apprehension. Heavenly Father, we bring them before you this morning and pray that you will protect them at this time and give them confidence as they readjust. We remember this morning those who have been bereaved during this time. We pray that you will comfort them and that they will know and feel your presence with them in the days and weeks ahead. We also bring before you this morning, Lord, those in care homes. May they feel your presence with them and know you see them as precious. We pray also for their carers and that they may know the importance of their job. Give them strength when they are tired and when the job becomes stressful. Father, we praise and thank you for all those working in the health service. We thank you for their vocational call to serve us. We pray that you will continue to guide, protect and encourage them in all aspects of their work. We pray, Lord, that as lockdown eases, that you will guide our business communities through the challenges as they reopen and strive to rebuild their businesses. Lord, we pray that you will grant them wisdom and inspiration for the task ahead. May they trust and rely on you for direction, guidance and strength. We pray for all those working in education at this time. We pray particularly that you will guide and encourage school principals and staff as they endeavour to address the issues for returning in September. Lord, we pray especially for those who are waiting for exam grades and are unsure of what the future holds for them. We pray that you will keep them free from anxiety and ask your blessing and protection on them all in the weeks ahead. We pray for our new president, the Reverend Tom McKnight, and our new lay reader, Hazel Loney. We thank you for them both and ask that they would receive from you the gifts which they need as they lead us and that they would know joy in serving you. We ask that you would protect and watch over them and their families, that in all things and every circumstance they might walk closely with you. We pray for and hold before you this morning those ministers and their families who are in the process of moving to new circuits. We pray that each family may know the blessing of being where you have placed them. Finally, we thank you, loving God, for the life and witness of our church family across the circuit. We thank you for the relationships that we share as churches on this circuit and with the communities in which we serve. We thank you for our Superintendent David and the ministerial team and pray that you will continue to bless, guide and direct them in all they do. As we prepare for our return to worship in each of our churches, Lord, help us all to support one another through the challenging times ahead. Our online services have been such a blessing to all. May our actions and work throughout the last number of months continue to provide a focus for our future worship and witness. We pray for your blessing on each society, that their life might speak of your love. Lord, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, you will renew and revive us all. We pray that each person may know and feel your presence with them in the coming days. So, Lord, we are thankful that you hear our prayers. In all that we do, be with us, we pray, and bless us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Let us go now in peace. Let us be courageous as we serve the world, holding on to that which is good, not returning evil for evil, strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, helping the afflicted, honouring all people, loving and serving the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit go with us. Amen.